Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual health talk. My name is Melissa, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. On behalf of the Patient Education and Engagement Program here at the University Health Network, I would like to thank you for attending today's session, Preparing for Surgery. Before we get started, we'd like to share some information about the new patient portal. UHN is preparing for a clinical transformation, launching a new health record system and patient portal on June 4th, 2022. If you're a current IUHN patient portal user, check your portal and monitor your email for news. There will be a few things that you need to do for a smooth transition to the new portal. If you're not a My UHN user, now is a great time to sign up. You can find more information about UHN's clinical transformation on uhn.ca or please reach out to the patient portal support team by phone at 416-340-3777 or by email at myuhn at uhn.ca. Uh, thanks everyone. So now going back to our health talk, I would like to take a minute to thank our planning team. Uh, the Patient Education and Engagement Program, the Patient Learning and Experience Centers, and education technology and media services. Now a few words about our online format. This session is being recorded and will be available for viewing with closed captioning at this same YouTube link afterwards. Today, we'll have a presentation for about 30, 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions for the rest of the session. If you have any questions about the live stream during the session, you can email us at pfep at uhn.ca or leave a voicemail at 416-603-6290 and a member of our team will get back to you shortly. On the topic of technology, we realize anything can happen when it comes to the internet connection. So with that said, should I get booted off or get cut out at any point, have no fear, you'll be seeing one of my wonderful colleagues step in to facilitate this session. Um, and to submit your questions during the session, we invite you to go to the link on your screen. You can also scan the code using your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app. You can submit questions anytime during the presentation. We wanna quickly thank those who have submitted questions already. It helps us see what people are interested in learning about most. Uh, we've tried our best to address these within the presentation, but we'll definitely answer them again during the question and answer period. When you submit your questions, you may notice it doesn't get posted right away. This is because we're now reviewing questions before they show up for the audience. This helps us make sure questions won't be repeated. It gives then it gives us more time to address new and different questions. It can also help us prepare how to answer the questions before they're posted. We just ask you to please keep in mind a few things before you submit your questions. First, you can choose to include your name or stay anonymous, but please note that others will be able to see your name if you do include it. Please do not include any personal details about your health or condition in your question. Our health talks are for general health information only, and the speakers are not here to diagnose or provide treatment recommendations. We'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can during the question and answer period. And lastly, you can also vote for your favorite questions by clicking the thumbs up button beside the question, and this will help bring that question closer to the top and it'll more likely be answered. Uh, we're all excited to also let you know that you can enter for a chance to win a $10 Tim Hortons gift card. To do so, you'll just have to fill out a feedback survey after the talk. The draw will close in a week on Thursday, March 3rd at 2 o'clock p.m. and we'll draw the name and notify the winner on Friday, March 4th. Uh, please make sure to enter your email address correctly and to check your spam and junk folders in case we get back to you. Now you're probably wondering, how do I fill out a feedback survey? please go to the link on your screen and complete the survey at the end of the session. The link is also available in the description box below, or you can scan the code using your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app and it'll take you to the survey. After you complete the survey, you'll see a link on the confirmation page to enter the draw. Um, we thank you in advance because your feedback will help us know what you liked, what we can improve on, and what topics you would like to see in the future. And now we'll move on to our presenters. We have quite a few people on our panel today. Uh, first, we'll hear from Christopher Bunting, who is a, who's retired after enjoying a career in the public relations and corporate affairs consulting business. He spent nine years as head of the London, England-based Global Consulting Group, and before that, he was Chief Executive of Labour Shandwick Canada. He currently serves as a Deputy Chair of the Toronto-based Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research and as a trustee of the Awareness Foundation. 
a London-based organization that provides education support programming to children and young people in Syria and Iraq. Um, our other patient guest speaker today is Sarah Charlesworth, who is an interior designer, artist, and mother of two. Sarah specializes in creating meditation spaces and sacred altars, both for private clients and retreat centers. She's also a digital artist, and she enjoys leading workshops, teaching others how to access their intuitive artists. Then we'll also hear from Dr. Daniel Santamina, who is an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education and cross-pointed to the Faculty of Medicine in the Department of Surgery. He's also a scientific associate in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Management and co-director of the Prehabilitation Program at the University Health Network. We'll also hear from Dr. Ian Randall, who is an anesthesiologist and ICU physician working primarily at Toronto Western Hospital. Based on his clinical experience working in ICU and interest in addressing frailty, he co-founded the UHM Prehabilitation Program in 2019. The goal of this multi multidisciplinary and collaborative program is to improve the outcomes for the highest risk surgical patients. He is an avid mountain biker who believes that exercise is the best medicine. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Sammy Chetty, who is a colorectal surgeon at the University Health Network and Princess Margaret Cancer Center for the clinical focus on gastrointestinal malignancies. He is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto and is also the clinical lead for gastrointestinal malignancies at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. So we have a great group of speakers today. Um, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University Health Network operates. At UHN, we strive to provide safe and inclusive care, which includes care before, during, and after surgery. And all that begins by honoring Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are the original inhabitants of this land and for thousands of years have cared for this land. Although we're presenting this health talk in the digital world today, we want to acknowledge and remind ourselves and encourage you to do the same too, wherever you're currently located, that we're still on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty an agreement to share, care for, and protect the resources around the Great Lakes in peace and respect. Today, this territory is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work, learn, and play on this territory. Now, enough from me. First, we'll hear from Christopher Bunting, who is one of our patient guest speakers today. Unfortunately, both he and Sarah weren't able to attend our live stream, but they have both graciously recorded their presentations. So we'll hear from Chris now and Sarah a little later. Good afternoon and many thanks for the opportunity to participate in this session of Health Talks. It's my first time participating and I'm looking forward to gaining some new knowledge and insights. By way of background, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer back in January of 2020 and started five weeks of chemotherapy and radiation treatments just the week before the first COVID-19 lockdown. Seems like a long time ago. I should add here that from that day to this, I've been very fortunate that not a single appointment or treatment had to be delayed because of the pandemic. At our first meeting, when we discussed treatment options followed by pretty major surgery, the surgeon asked me if I would be interested in the prehabilitation research study, which would give me regular access to a kinesiologist and a psychologist in the weeks and months leading up to my surgery in June of 2020. I've been blessed all my life with good health to this point, so I felt I was moving abruptly into foreign territory with a lot of unfamiliar information to digest and significant decisions to be made. The prehabilitation study would help me prepare for this journey. I said I would like to join the study and I'm very glad that I did. I immediately felt the additional support of both the kinesiologist who met regularly with me via Zoom to go through an exercise program and the psychologist. I felt that I was actually doing something to enhance my chances of successful surgery and recovery rather than taking a passive stance. My non-medical advice to anyone facing surgery is to get yourself as fit as you can before your operation. It's absolutely worth it. So while I was maintaining my physical fitness, I also found discussions with the psychologist to be very useful. One small comment by him during one of our phone conversations made a big difference to me. 
As I was someone who traveled a lot for business, the psychologist said he suspected I was probably used to being in control throughout my professional life, which was absolutely accurate. And all of a sudden, that sense of control was gone. As an analogy, he suggested I see the surgeon as that airline pilot I completely trusted each time I boarded a plane. That surgeon is your pilot, he said. Let her do her job, and you only need to focus on your part. That story seems so simple, yet it made me feel more comfortable with what I was facing, and it is what I remembered when they wheeled me into the operating room. Without question, my life has been different since surgery. I am still under surveillance, and the journey is ongoing. But because of prehabilitation, I made sure to make, it, make exercise part of my daily routine. And that has allowed me to get back to skiing and doing other things that I like. I'm delighted the prehabilitation program is now offered across the UHN, especially now when so many people are waiting for surgery dates. Other follow-up UHN programs focus on both exercise and nutrition have also been of great value. As patients, it's a given that none of us really wants to be here, but it is part of life and we're fortunate to live in a city with the resources that we have. Thank you and good luck to all of us. Thank you, Chris, for sharing your experience with us. Now, building on what we learned from Chris, we'll hear from Drs. Mandel, Chadi, and Santamina, who will share their expertise around why preparing for surgery is important, what to prepare before surgery, ways to improve your physical and mental well-being before surgery, and they'll also speak to some resources at UHN and in the community that can help you learn more about preparing for surgery. Over to you, Dr. Randall. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, so why should we prepare for surgery? You know, we would prepare for a lot of things in our lives, major events, and surgery would be considered one of them. So we prepare for a big trip or travels, we prepare for an exam, we prepare for a job interview, or maybe a major sporting event if we're so lucky to be able to go to the Olympics, for instance. But in my experience as an anesthesiologist, seeing patients in the preoperative space, we, you know, if you've been in this uh, position before, you will have met with a nurse and or anesthesiologist who's, you know, taking a very comprehensive history of your health, uh, health conditions. And that helps us to, to really uh, focus in on your needs, uh, mostly during the surgery and afterwards. But what uh, I was noticing over time is that there were some elements that we could, you know, potentially look at and certainly, um, uh, certainly yeah. patients would, would have um, other things that we could potentially help them to improve. So next slide, please, uh, Melissa. So one of the things that we noticed is that um, patients who may have lower level of fitness, and that might be actually related to the condition that they're having surgery for, but uh, research has been uh, growing to demonstrate that people with lower levels of fitness have a higher risk of um, having more complications after surgery. They may stay in hospital for longer. Um, that may result in higher hospital and healthcare, overall healthcare costs. And perhaps uh, more drastically may contribute to uh, mortality after surgery. So there are opportunities potentially to improve on physical fitness prior to surgery. Um, and next slide, please. So malnutrition is another um, component that we were noticing uh, could, could uh, be addressed in the preoperative space. We know that all, a very large proportion of patients admitted to hospital, this isn't just surgical patients, but also um, uh, medical patients are either malnourished or at risk of having uh, malnutrition. And what malnutrition really is, is, is having a little bit a little too little or, or too much of certain nutrients can be related to the underlying condition or to other factors uh, in, in a patient's life. Um, but what it means is that uh, patients who are malnourished, especially prior to surgery, may have an impaired ability to, um, to heal, for instance, properly after surgery. And so these are things that we thought we might be able to uh, target as uh, 
as uh, elements in our in our program that Daniel will speak of shortly. Next slide, please. So, some of the potential impacts, uh, just to to uh, elaborate on that, of of inadequate nutrition prior to surgery, um, physical functioning, including rehabilitation, um, surgical complications such as infect wound infections, also, also hospital length of stay, similarly to physical fitness and readmissions to hospital after surgery. And all of these things, of course, can have the ultimate uh, impact, uh, which could be potentially increasing uh, mortality after surgery, as well as increased healthcare costs. Next slide, please. So one, one element that uh, we've been learning a lot over the past uh, while in collaboration with uh, colleagues in psychology at um, Princess Margaret Hospital is specifically that uh, anxiety, of course, prior to surgery is understandably um, very common, perhaps even to some extent expected, but uh, it's, all, it's also associated with uh, more acute pain after surgery and longer stays in the hospital. So certainly people with underlying prior uh, history of chronic stress, anxiety, and depression can increase risk of chronic pain after surgery. And so it could be that uh, having an optimistic perspective may reduce uh, chronic pain after surgery and uh, addressing some of the underlying uh, aspects of anxiety may, help, may be able to uh, help improve uh, patients' overall sense of well-being as, as well as their surgical experience. So this, this will hopefully have uh, an impact on recovery after surgery. Next slide, please. So ultimately major surgery, just going back to the idea that preparing uh, for surgery is important. Major surgery is like running a marathon and both require training. Next slide, please. So I'll hand over uh, the talk to my colleague, uh, Dr. Santamina, and he'll describe what is prehabilitation and talk a little bit about what we're doing at UHN in this, in this space. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. It's a really great pleasure to be speaking with you all today. And indeed, I'm excited to talk about what prehabilitation is and build on what Dr. Randall stated as an important element of our care in terms of being prepared for a significant stressor in our lives. Uh, but before talking specifically about how prehabilitation is delivered, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Sarah to discuss her experiences with prehabilitation. Hello, my name is Sarah and I'm a 49 year old interior designer, artist and mother of two. And last summer I was diagnosed with breast cancer stage three. Nothing prepares you for a moment like that. I went into a sort of state of shock and then overwhelm. I called up a friend who I knew had been through treatment twice. And she said to me, the single greatest piece of advice I can give you is to exercise through the entire thing. And I was sort of surprised that it was not what I expected her to say. Shortly after that, I happened upon a documentary which spoke about using exercise to help chemo patients alleviate their symptoms. They shared how it was so significant how much better they did after exercise that it stuck with me as an important way that I could help to meet my doctors halfway, a way that I could feel like I had some sort of sense of control and also to be healing my body in conjunction with the medical system. When I researched and found this program, I was so excited to be let in. And I am so grateful that I was able to get a spot because I tried to think of this whole journey like a mountain climb. And stage three making it the most difficult mountain climb that I could possibly imagine. And my prehab trainer, Priya, became my guide up that mountain. She looked at my specific case and gave me tools and guidance and helped me to map my path to healing. Our weekly sessions not only helped me to make my body stronger as it was feeling weaker in other ways as I prepared for surgery, but also it helped me psychologically, that relationship alleviating some of the isolation and confusion that comes with getting a diagnosis. Our training made such a difference to me functionally after surgery. 
I'm now five, almost six weeks post-surgery. And I remember 24 hours after surgery, trying to get out of bed and realizing that I couldn't use my arms. I had a bilateral mastectomy, like, which was quite, it's quite painful at that point. And I was afraid to use my arms to get out of bed and suddenly sitting up and realizing that I could get up and stand up completely using my abdominal muscles. I was so surprised. And then I suddenly realized, oh, this is all the training that we have been doing. The specific exercises that I was given to prepare for my specific surgery have made a world of difference in my ability to function afterwards as a mom, as a person moving through the world. This program is so essential. I am so grateful to be able to share it with you and I will encourage anybody I know to participate in it. Thank you so much for listening and I wish you all the luck on your journey. Take care. Thank you so much, Sarah, for those thoughtful, engaging, and inspiring words. Um, I'd love to jump in a little bit more into what prehabilitation is and how we deliver it at UHN and what the literature has shown has been quite helpful in terms of preparing patients for surgery. So prehabilitation is a process that occurs between the time of diagnosis and the beginning of treatment. And as you'll note, I'll use the word treatment because being prepared for any major stressor, including other therapies, not necessarily just surgery, is important. Prehabilitation includes assessing the whole patient and understanding the multiple ways in which health can be affected, which ultimately can create changes in our well being that reduce our function. And function is a term, or functional capacity is a term that you will probably use quite often in this talk about the benefits of prehabilitation because the more function we have, it, de it demonstrates the more resilient and the more tolerant we can be of various stressors like surgery. So function, whether it's physiological, physical, biological, or psychosocial is important. And to understand where we lack function or where there are opportuni opportunities to improve function, we need to strive to do that. So we try to do uh, targeted interventions for people who have demonstrated uh, reductions in functional capacity or who are vulnerable to reduced function. So overall, prehabilitation is about enhancing our body's function before treatment so that we can improve our outcomes after treatment. And it really is an investment in our health that we should see the payoff for after some of these significant stressors. Prehab fits in our healthcare journey now. As you may understand, after a diagnosis, perhaps you had thought that it would just jumped into treatment. And perhaps after treatment, there would be rehabilitation. And then over the long term, you'd be looked to, to try to self-manage some of your symptoms or, or follow up with various healthcare providers to make sure that those symptoms are managed well. Well, the idea of prehabilitation is that it's a starting, it's a start of our treatment. And in fact, surgery isn't the first day of our treatment. It starts, in fact, actually before that, and in fact, and in fact, well before that, in ways where we become more prepared for surgery so that our outcomes are better. In terms of our provision of prehab, what's included? Well, at least for in, in terms of the medical literature, in terms of what we found from our research, Prehab is generally described as an important multimodal intervention. And what do I mean by multimodal? Well, I'm referring to making sure that our health is managed well from a medical standpoint, and it could include re reviewing medications or other medical conditions that could result in lower function. When you think about function, perhaps you're th thinking about how well our body moves. So improving how we move is often thought of as something that we could improve with exercise. So whether it's aerobic training or resistance training or other exercise that affect areas of our body that may be most affected by surgery. As Dr. Randall stated earlier, nutrition is a key component of how we function. And sometimes we need to consult with experts in that space, like a dietitian or nutritionist to make sure that we're eating well and have a strategy to resolve any malnutrition. Anxiety and distress, as discussed previously, are very common amongst people who are about to undergo a significant health treatment. And so learning about ways in which we can manage that stress are important because inevitably stress does play a role in how we, how we tolerate various treatments as well as how we recover from them. And finally, within the context of multimodal rehabilitation and its research, smoking cessation has often been included because smoking has a profound negative impact on many 
surgical outcomes. So we definitely need to make sure that we curb some unhealthy behaviors as well. So what does the research say about prehabilitation? Well, first and foremost, it's been growing so fast and it's specifically it's been describing how well it works in many different settings across cancer surgeries and cardiac surgeries and many other types. It definitely has shown that it provides important benefits. Also, it's very safe. There have been very few adverse events associated with prehabilitation. It improves our body's aerobic function both before and after surgery. And as stated previously, function is key to making sure that we reduce some of the surgical complications that may result in longer hospital length of stays, as well as making sure that we're able to recover quickly and have a better quality of life over the co course of our entire treatment experience. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Chaddy to talk about his experiences and thoughts about the benefits of prehabilitation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sammy Chaddy. I'm a surgeon here at University Health Network. I uh, focus on the area of uh, abdominal surgery and uh, um, colorectal surgery. And oftentimes that involves treating patients with um, conditions that can be progressive and uh, uh, longstanding and take a uh, significant toll on their health otherwise. And to that effect, uh, these operations can uh, take many hours at times, and the effect of the operation on the patient is, uh, is quite significant. So when patients start at a certain baseline after surgery, they're often at a much lower baseline that they then have to recover from as well. And after surgery, we always talk about the acute por portion of the recovery, which is when they're in hospital. And then there's the chronic portion of the recovery, which is in the rehab facility, um, potentially in the rehab facility, or at home over the next few weeks and potentially a few months. And to that end, we've been uh, working very closely with the prehabilitative program to uh, help optimize the health of our patients in the preoperative setting. So if they come in with a higher uh, level of preoperative health, then the effect of surgery on them is less in the way of how they would come out of surgery and from the recovery in hospital. Whenever we talk uh, to our trainees about surgery, um, we always talk about the fact that most of the time, it's not a question of whether we could operate on someone, it's whether we should operate on someone. And what prehabilitation has really done for us is it's allowed us to take that question of should operate on patients and um, really address it quite significantly in being able to offer surgery more frequently to patients who might not have otherwise been candidates for an operation. We've seen excellent results, uh, especially in uh, patients who um, are much more uh, dedicated to the program. Uh, patients have been coming in with a higher state of physical health, a um, uh, uh, better uh, car uh, cardiorespiratory stamina. Um, they've been coming in in a better weight state. We know that patients who are, um, uh, who, who are overweight or significantly underweight do worse with operations. Um, and also um, uh, patients have been leaving hospital earlier after surgery. Even though we practice a lot of minimally invasive surgery, which means that the incisions might be smaller and the, um, and the visual aspect of surgery on the patient's abdomen might be less, the same amount of work is being done inside the abdomen, which has just as much of a toll at times as a larger incision. And to that end, when patients are coming in in these better states of physical health and honestly in better states of mental health, um, they, they tend to do much better and they tend to recover much faster as well. One of the big questions is what can you do now? And um, following these uh, recommendations is so crucial, even just as a, as a general concept in life, but uh, especially in the preoperative setting. You know, surgery isn't, uh, as you'll hear many of us say, surgery is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And if you wanna make it through a marathon, you need to be much healthier than if you wanted to make it through a quick sprint. Um, get to know your surgical team. 
your surgical team, your surgeons, your nurses, your administrative assistants, your physiotherapists, dietitians are available to you and they want to help you. They want to see you do well with these operations and they want to try to get you to the best possible preoperative shape. More importantly, they want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into, but more, and they want to make sure that you understand everything. I tell a lot of my patients that I want you to understand what you're about to go through as much as I understand what you're about to go through without the surgical and technical nuances um, that we, uh, um, that we, that we have to um, uh, focus on as the, as the, as the surgical team. Um, try not to leave any gaps in your knowledge because these gaps can be a source of anxiety. It can be a source of stress. And it, um, we, we know that from a lot of our patients, when they come into surgery with a full state of understanding, uh, they tend to be much more comfortable and at ease with their decision on preparing and proceeding with surgery. And uh, lastly, I would just say that we're all here for you. We're all here to support you. And we want to see you succeed with, this, uh, with these uh, procedures. And if there's anything we can ever do to be of further assistance, please do let us know. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the um, uh, surgical team and the uh, colorectal surgical team at University Health Network and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much, Dr. Chatty, for sharing those supportive and encouraging words. It's really great to hear the surgeon's perspective on the value of prehabilitation. So many of you are wondering, what can I do now? What is it that I can do to make sure that my surgery goes as well as it possibly can? Well, if you're in this space where you're thinking about surgery and how you can best prepare, um, we'll hope to share a few things that we would recommend you do in the meantime. So let's start with exercise. Now, in terms of exercise, there are some risks and we want to make sure that you're as safe as possible. So to ensure that you are, please talk to a healthcare provider before starting exercise and make sure that they provide you with some indication of what might be safest for you. But in general, when we're talking about exercise, the general idea is that we want you to be as active as possible. Sometimes that means walking, sometimes that means being exer exercising at a higher intensity. But in general, we want you to do routine aerobic and resistance training to make sure that we're strengthening our heart, our lungs, as well as our muscles. And you also have to take into consideration your current level of fitness, as well as other health factors. For some, exercise may be easier prior to treatment because you don't have those treatment side effects who may be that may be making it more difficult to exercise. On the other hand, for some, you may find it actually quite difficult to exercise prior to surgery because perhaps surgery is going to resolve some of those challenges that you're facing with your health. The idea is to tailor the exercise to your personal circumstance to make sure that A, you can be as safe and effective as possible in your exercise training, but also do it in a way that you can sustain over the entire prehabilitation period. Some things to consider about exercise. Well, think about the changes that your body may experience as a result of surgery. Perhaps there are tissues that are going to be more affected than others. For example, if you're having surgery uh, for prostate cancer, pelvic floor exercises may be important for you or for breast cancer, perhaps it's shoulders or for thoracic surgeries, perhaps it's exercises that strengthen the muscles that help you breathe. In most circumstances, it's probably very helpful to talk to an exercise professional who can help you with your exercise prescription and make sure it's just right for you. Some exercise professionals that may be appropriate include kinesiologists, physiotherapists, and exercise physiologists. And these, these may be available at your local gym. Some may be able to come to your home to help you train. Current circumstances might actually lead to, to participating in online classes and if available, perhaps in a community center. When we're thinking about nutrition, I would say our two main goals are to avoid malnutrition. And that means basically having the right amount of nutrients, not too many and not too few. And in many cases also making sure that we promote anabolism, which is a fancy word for muscle growth. We wanna make sure that we have enough muscle and protein to sustain some of the deconditioning that can be associated with surgery and recovery. Promoting anabolism is also important because we're gonna be exercising as well. So ensuring that we have enough protein and carbohydrates, hydrates, 
is essential to making sure our exercises are able to be performed in a safe manner. In general, we highly recommend that patients follow Canada's food guide, which provides reliable information on our nutrition needs for the vast majority of people. In some cases, additional nutrients like protein or total calories may be required. And it's often recommended that you consult with a registered dietitian to make sure that your needs are specifically addressed. Stress is a big part of surgery, and we really want you to be as mentally prepared for surgery as well. So we want you to manage the stress as well as distress, which may include anxiety or depression, using, using strategies like relaxation or meditation or other, other movement-based stress reduction activities like yoga or tai chi. In addition to mental health strategies, um, we want to make sure that you're thinking about how to sustain behaviors over the long term. And sometimes to make sure that we're managing stress as well as changing our behaviors over the short course in the prehabilitation period as well as long afterwards. Seeking counseling from a healthcare professional, such as a psychologist or a psychotherapist, may be appropriate. Some additional prehab components that you may want to consider are the review of other health conditions, some that may be related to your surgery or others that may not be. But the idea is that we wanna make sure that all of your health concerns are addressed so that you can be as healthy as you can be before going into surgery or on, into other treatments. This may involve consulting with other healthcare providers regarding the prescriptions that you have. It may involve seeking support related to smoking cessation or other substance use and Surely we wanna make sure that you're well rested and have a lot of energy because there is a quite a toll that surgery and other treatments can take on your body. So enough rest, enough sleep is definitely on the prehabilitation program. So as we're, as we're turning towards our thoughts after surgery, many might say that your recovery actually starts before surgery and that is being as fit as you can possibly be, but also understanding what surgery and that post-operative experience is like. Talk to your healthcare team about what to expect after surgery and during your recovery. Understand when they want you to stand up and start moving after surgery or what the rehabilitation plan may be. Familiarize yourself with that rehabilitation plan and think about the side effects that may be in the way of participating in rehabilitation or things that may require additional management from your healthcare providers. All of this will make sure that you have a smooth recovery and are prepared when you're discharged. The bottom line, we want you to be as healthy as you can be before treatment, and we want you to seek the support you need to achieve it. Very often we say healthier in, healthier out. So do your best to be as healthy as possible. Where can you go for some more information and support? Well, we're very fortunate at the UHN to have a prehabilitation program. In this prehabilitation program, patients undergo a comprehensive health evaluation. They partake in the modalities that we discussed, including exercise, nutrition, stress management, as well as consultation with other health professionals as needed interventions are highly tailored to the individual to make sure that they're safe and effective. And we follow up with the patients routine, routinely to make sure that they're ready for surgery. If you have any questions about our prehabilitation program at UHN, our email address is prehabilitation at uhn.ca, or feel free to visit us at uhn.ca slash prehab. And lastly, we encourage you all to contact the UHN Patient and Family Library if you have any additional questions about your treatments. The telephone is, number is here. It's 416-603-6277, or feel free to email us at twpfl at uhn.ca. Thank you so much, and all the best in your preparations. So this brings us to the end of the presentation component of our health talk. Um, on behalf of our participants in the patient education program, thank you so much, Chris, Sarah, Dr. Randall, Dr. Santamina, and Dr. Chatty for sharing your expertise and experience about preparing for surgery. So we'll now take a look at our Slido to see what questions have um, been submitted. You can still submit questions if you haven't already. And to do so, please go to slido.com and enter UHN health, or excuse me, health talk in the event code. 
You can also scan the code using your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app and it'll take you straight to the page. As a friendly reminder, you can choose to include your name or stay anonymous, but please note that others will be able to see your name if you do include it. We also want to note that since only Dr. Randall and Dr. Sanamina are available to join us today live for the Q&A, they'll try to answer as many of your questions as they can. But if you have any questions specifically for Chris, Sarah, or Dr. Chatty, please email us at pfep at uhn.ca and we'll share the questions with them after the presentation. Um, we also just want to remind everyone to not include any personal details about your health or condition in your questions. Uh, again, we're reviewing the questions before they're posted to make sure they're relevant and even to help us plan to answer the questions. And there may be some instances where we may rephrase the questions to help clarify them for the speakers. If we haven't covered your question fully, please feel free to email us afterwards and we'll get some more information for you. Okay, so starting from the top. Uh, Susan, thank you, Susan, for your question. She has, they have asked, how do we get involved in prehabilitation? I have major surgery plan and have been advised to get fit, but I could benefit from greater direction, discipline, and I could really benefit from psychological supports. Daniel or Ian? Sure. Thank you, Susan, so much for that question. Uh, great to hear that you're interested in getting involved in prehabilitation. Um, Indeed, it's great to be fit as we've talked about in this talk. And um, very often we hear that patients do want more information and very specific direction on how they can do that. If you're a UHN patient, you may want to speak with your healthcare team to be referred to the UHN prehabilitation program, and we can certainly help you with that. And if you're not a UHN patient, I would say that the health professions that we've been describing in this talk are widely available in the community. Again, they may be physiotherapists or kinesiologists, dietitians or nutritionists, psychologists, psychotherapists, or social workers. Specifically, that group of healthcare professionals may be best able to help you with the psychological supports if you're, if you're quite anxious or are thinking a lot about the impacts of surgery. So many of these healthcare providers are indeed available in the community, and, and you may want to uh, look for someone in your neighborhood or or do a little bit of research for a healthcare professional that would be able to help you with this, but uh, they are available. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you again, Susan, for your question. Okay, our next question. Meeting with the surgeon, I was asked to fill out a questionnaire for a chart and was stuck when asked about former surgeries. Should I keep track of these for future reference? Why would a surgeon want to know about other surgeries since anesthetic reactions are usually covered separately? Is there an app? That's a great question. Um, so uh, just like with any elements in one's uh, previous medical history, it's always important to try to provide as much information as you possibly can about your past uh, health history including surgeries, because uh, the, 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 any little bit of information might have an impact. Sometimes it may not, not necessarily, uh, as you're kind of alluding to, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's always best to try to be as comprehensive as, as possible. And indeed, anesthetic reactions are covered separately, but uh, one is never sure um, uh, that, uh, you know, ahead of time, um, uh, if, if something is, is related or not to what is upcoming, like a surgery that's uh, coming up. Um, so one thing that people often do that I actually find very helpful as a, as a healthcare provider is if somebody comes in with a list of uh, prior conditions, hospitalizations, uh, surgeries, allergies, medications, the whole list of things. And that's a really easy way to, to, to keep, track of, uh, keep track of those details. Um, I'm not sure personally if there's a, if there's an app available. I would be wouldn't be surprised if there were, but uh, often the old-fashioned piece of paper is just as effective as as uh, a specific app. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Dr. Randall. And I know at UHN we have the My Surgery Guide, so that could also be a really great resource to help you keep track of um, your treatments and health conditions and medications too. 
So we'll now take a look at the next question. Um, so if someone has asked, I've expected to meet with a surgeon and sometimes met with a fellow or physician's assistant. Since surgery is so important to me, I felt nervous, sleepless, and forgotten to repeat what I explained to the first person who was shadowing the actual surgeon. Should I just repeat everything again? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, it's, uh, it can sometimes feel a bit uh, frustrating to, to meet with a trainee and then to meet with a supervising physician or surgeon. Um, it, uh, it's fairly safe to assume uh, that uh, the information, at least when the trainee is reporting back to the surgeon that they're providing as much information as they possibly can in the report. And then with the second meeting with the supervising a physician or surgeon that uh, you know they may ask some of the similar questions or, or same questions, um, but I think the main point to to, to ask as uh, the per, the person uh, on the receiving side of the healthcare is is if you have any questions or concerns or you feel that something has you know not necessarily been represented the way you would want it to, I think it's really important to feel empowered to clarify or ask additional questions or ask if, if uh, something had been addressed prior um, and, and to uh, follow up at the end of the discussion with, um, with uh, you know, any, any sort of uh, questions that may, may come up as you discuss uh, throughout the, the appointment. Um, it may not be necessary to repeat everything again, but there may be some elements that um, that you want to emphasize, and it's totally okay to to go over that uh, information with a, sort of the second stage of the, the appointment. Thank you, Dr. Randall. Okay. For our next question. So Susan has asked, how can you keep patients better informed of expected wait time and whether this is acceptable wait time? How can patients be apprised of steps being taken to plan surgery? As a patient, we are in an information void hoping for information. The stress of waiting is agony. Our lives are put on hold. So thank you, Susan, for your question. And we totally empathize with the experience that patients have to go through while waiting for surgery. Um, and we appreciate that you submitted this question earlier because it gave us a chance to get some more information for you. So we know that each hospital is very different and the treatments are all very different when it comes to wait times, but Ontario Health has a really great resource where you can get up-to-date information about wait times um, at different hospitals and also for specific procedures. So I will show, share this website with you very quickly. So if you go to Ontario.ca, or even if you Google wait times in Ontario, this is one of the first websites that come up. And it gives you the up-to-date information about wait times. So it's even broken down to the type of specialist and surgery, um, even things like the emergency departments and diagnostic imaging. And what's really great is that it even explains how um, what these numbers mean and how um, they've gathered this information. So we encourage you to, to go to this website to get this information, and this is where you'll get the, the most detail, but also checking in with your surgeon and your um, healthcare team as well, because they may even be able to provide some specific information for your specific case. Um, and again, this website can be accessed from Ontario.ca or by Googling wait times in Ontario. Uh, Melissa, so if I may add, yeah. I, you know, the idea of this being on hold is very, very upsetting for many patients, uh, probably for all, uh, and is something that is very common that we are hearing right now. Um, if, I, if I may suggest that we, we think about prehabilitation, again, we think that it's not necessarily something that is separate from your treatment, but is in fact a part of your treatment. So whereas you may be feeling like you're on hold, in fact, perhaps prehabilitation is something that keeps you moving forward so that you are as prepared as you can be for when your surgical date is decided upon and, and put yourself in the best opportunity to be healthy throughout the entire experience. So we totally understand that it does feel like you're on hold, but there is 
an opportunity to be as empowered and proactive about your healthcare in that wait time, as difficult as it may be. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that you added that in because if I may paraphrase um, Christopher, what he had said was being a part of prehab made him feel like he was doing something while he was waiting for his surgery. So totally echo what you said about the being proactive but also feeling like you're doing something while you're waiting too. Thank you. Okay, so going back to our Slido and thank you again, Susan, for your great question. Um, so I think the other question here, I'll just <laughs> summarize really quickly is again about wait time. So to determine the wait time for surgery, is that determined by the surgeon? Because there must be a backlog due to the pandemic. So it's a triage. Can a patient see common wait times for different procedures in public domain software? So again, what we had just reiterated, um, there's so many factors and we totally echo and empathize again that it's really tough to have to wait and not know when your surgery will happen. But please check out the Ontario Health Wait Times um, website to get that information. Uh, okay, so our next question. Um, my surgery isn't for a while, but I'm feeling very nervous already. What tips do you have for managing pre-surgery anxiety? Um, Daniel, I think I'll turn this one over to you. Sure. Uh, anxiety um, and worry about surgery is so common. So what, what, what do we do in terms of maybe first line strategies for people to manage their pre-surgery anxiety? Well, first and foremost, we try to support patients in managing their overall energy levels to some extent. And that sometimes requires meditation or, or being mindful. And in fact, on in, on the internet, there are many different sources of video guided imagery and video guided strategies to, to meditate or be mindful. In some circumstances, you may need support on one-on-one -on -one basis to ma manage anxiety. And, and it probably relates to the severity of anxiety. In cases where you're highly anxious or you feel like you might need some additional support, connecting with a healthcare provider who specializes in psychology, and this may be a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist or a social worker, to name a few, they may be the best person to speak to about managing some severe anxiety. But for many patients, we're able to support them with some general stress reduction techniques like meditation, mindfulness, Tai Chi, and yoga. Thank you, Daniel. And if I may add too, our last health talk was on managing anxiety. So there may be some tips in there for you as well, even if it is more general and not specifically for surgery. All right, I'm just gonna mute for a second <laughs> before this, while this overhead announcement is happening. Okay, maybe not, but very quickly, the next question, Oops, I'm sorry. I think I archived it by accident, but the question was about high intensity training and what that means. Thank you, Melissa. I, I did see that question. What are some examples of high intensity exercise training? Uh, well, maybe some of you have heard of high intensity interval training or HIT. It's a very common form of exercise being studied right now in prehabilitation. And what HIT is, it's a strategy that basically intersperses very intense bouts of exercise that are very short with rest periods or very low intensity intervals. So for example, you may exercise at near maximal intensity for one minute. And then after that one minute ends, you just do some very light exercising for the subsequent minute. And when that minute's up, you jump back up to high intensity for a minute and then back down. And you do this interval approach to training where you have high intensity activity interspersed with low intensity activity. And sometimes the entire duration of that, inter of that session may only be 10 minutes, 10 minutes of high intensity and 10 minutes of low intensity in between those high intensity bouts. So how do we do this in our lab or in our program? Very often it's conducted on a treadmill or on a stationary cycle but it doesn't necessarily have to be. You can do high intensity training even by walking. So perhaps if you have a lap, uh, excuse me, if you have a track nearby, maybe you walk very vigorously across the straightaways and then go a little slower around the bends. And then again, very 
vigorously around the straightaway and then slower around the bends. Um, if you're doing this at home, perhaps you use your stairs. You can one minute of up and down a few steps and then take a minute to just walk around uh, your house a little bit at a lower intensity. But the idea is that in high intensity interspersed with low intensity allows you get, to get a high volume of exercise in, but not necessarily burning you out so quickly with, with a long, a long period of high intensity exercise. And I'll just say one more thing, Melissa. Yeah. When we talk about high intensity, what does that really mean? It means when you're struggling to catch your breath or when you're uh, really working so hard that it's kind of hard to have a conversation with your workout partner and your heart rate is beating very fast and you're working really hard. And it only takes a few seconds for it to come back down, especially when you're very fit. But the idea is you can work for that period only for so long before you need to rest. But interspersing those high intensity bouts with shorter intensity bouts allows you to get a solid volume of exercise in, in a short period of time. And HIT is very effective at improving uh, aerobic capacity and functional capacity, which in turn have been associated with reductions in surgical complications and overall well being and improved overall well being after surgery. Great. Thank you so much for that great explanation. <laughs> okay. Our next question. Um, so Susan has asked, um, given all the stated benefits of rehab, I'm surprised I haven't been referred. What are the criteria for referral? Um, so maybe Daniel can speak on behalf of the UHN's program. Sure. At the UHN, our criteria for referral are uh, a surgery that is likely planned, and sometimes there's no date yet, but the idea is that surgery is probably a part of your overall treatment plan. There are not a whole number of other referral criteria per se, but I will say that when surgeons are thinking about whether or not to refer to our program, they are thinking about those who may benefit most. And typically those who are more frail or who are demonstrating some deconditioning or who are uh, likely to decondition prior to treatment or those who have other vulnerabilities that may increase their risk of an adverse surgical outcome or some problems with their surgery. So I would say that many of the surgeons are thinking actively about what patients may be most appropriate for prehab. Now, while they are thinking about it, I would encourage patients that if you are feeling that there are ways in which your optimal health could be benefited by prehab, have that conversation with your surgeon and your healthcare team. Perhaps they're not aware of psychological or other functional limitations that are unrelated to your health condition that, that, uh, is in, that require surgery that may in fact be great reasons for a referral. So it probably just needs to be a discussion with your healthcare provider. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so unfortunately, I now see that it's 1.58 p.m. and we'll need to wrap up our session. Uh, so just going back to our presentation here. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for submitting questions, but especially thank you, um, Dr. Randall and Dr. Santamina, for taking the time to answer these questions and providing such great responses, too. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, please email us at pfvp at uhm.ca, and we'll try to respond within one week. And again, if you had any specific questions for Chris, Sarah, or Dr. Chatty, please email us, and we'll be sure to, to forward that to them. Um, your feedback is very important to us, so please go to the link on your screen and complete the survey. Or again, you can scan the code using your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app, and it'll take you straight to the survey. Uh, you can also um, enter a chance to win a $10 uh, Tim Hortons gift card if you fill out a survey. Uh, the link to enter the draw will be on the confirmation page of your completed survey. And again, the draw will close on Thursday, March 3rd at 2 o'clock p.m. And we'll draw the name and notify the winner on Friday, March 4th. So please make sure to enter your email address correctly and to check your spam in junk folders um, in case you're the winner and we get back to you. Uh, finally, to find out about our next talk, uh, subscribe to our online patient e-newsletter and get up-to-date information about events and new resources at UHN. To fill out a form to subscribe, please go to the link on your screen. And this link again will um, be available on the confirmation page of your feedback survey. 
Uh, so thank you again for attending and again to our presenters. And we hope to see you at our next talk in March.